Hello everyone. Today's lecture is the nature of science. In any science class, the first question that we really should be looking at is this one. What is science? Well, science is a way of understanding the world. It is a worldview. There are other worldviews, for example, philosophy, religion. Uh, however, we'll be focusing on the scientific worldview. Now, within the scientific worldview, we need to understand that science is going to be based upon observations. Science has a specific set of rules that it does follow. Scientific claims and ideas are subject to testing. The results of science are tentative, which means they're subject to change. And we should emphasize also that the, um, there's a lot of importance for creativity, imagination, and logic within scientific endeavors. Science does attempt to ask and answer three basic questions. The first is, what's out there? A biologist may be interested in learning about life on our planet. They may, in the course of their studies, discover a new species of plant. The next question, how does it work? Uh, specifically, uh, let's imagine that we have discovered a new species of plant. We might ask, how does this plant reproduce? The answer to this question could be that the plant uses fruits to ensure seed dispersal. Animals eat the, uh, eat the fruit. Uh, within the fruit is, uh, are the seeds. Uh, the seeds are going to be deposited by this animal in a different location at a later time. They can germinate and grow, and we have new plants. Uh, and then finally, how did things get to be like this in the first place? Why is it that plants produce fruits? In biology, we place a very high importance on understanding life in an evolutionary context. So how did fruit production evolve in the first place? Science works in specific ways. <clears throat> we know that science relies on evidence from the natural world. This evidence is going to be examined and then interpreted using logic and mathematics. Creativity, again, we see is important, uh, but there are rules that do need to be followed. Uh, we also know that there's a lot of interplay between science and culture. One area where science and culture do overlap is when we investigate the difference of science and pseudoscience. Uh, within science, an example of this is astronomy. Uh, a pseudoscience example would be astrology. Uh, science, um, claims in science are going to be testable. They're based on experiments. They're based on data. Uh, the claims and ideas in science are falsifiable. Within pseudoscience, we have things which are not testable or have not been tested. They're based more upon beliefs and do require faith. Uh, one interesting example of this is herbal remedies. Herbal remedies are uh, very often marketed with claims that they're going to do a lot of great things for those who are using the herbal remedies. However, the claims that those companies are making have not been evaluated by the FDA. And there have been a number of examples of herbal remedies that have later on been uh, shown to actually cause health problems for the people who are using them. Goals of science. There are two main goals of science, explanatory power and predictive power. Explanatory power under this category, we assume that we can learn about the world through observation and our explanations are going to be tested using evidence from the natural world. The type of thing that we might try to explain in science could be something like, why do earthquakes happen? Predictive power, here we're making useful predictions about future events. Uh, again, examining earthquakes, where are earthquakes most likely to happen and when will they take place? Science is a process. We know that scientific ideas are developed through reasoning. Uh, scientific claims are based on testing explanations against observations of the natural world, and very important here, rejecting the ones that fail the test. If scientific testing shows that we have made claims or developed ideas which are inaccurate, we do need to reject those. Uh, also, scientific claims are subject to peer review and replication. The final statement on this slide says there is no such thing as, in quotations, the scientific method. Why is this true? Well. Many of us in earlier grades were perhaps taught that there's a very strict, rigid sequence of events that have to happen for something to be scientific. We need to ask a question. We need to form a hypothesis. We need to then design an experiment, conduct the experiment, gather data, analyze the data, form conclusions, publish. Here's the thing. Scientists don't always work in that strict sequence of events. Sometimes they may do things in different orders. And uh, it's important to understand that a more accurate way of describing what science is is that there's a set of skills that scientists use and apply to try to understand the natural world. Um, one final idea about this, um, you know, we need to understand that many important discoveries in science were actually made by accident. 
And the scientists who made those discoveries were behaving scientifically, even though they didn't follow this rigid sequence of events. For example, Fleming's discovery of penicillin was an accidental discovery. However, Fleming was using a number of very important scientific skills in order to better understand this compound, which inhibited the growth of bacteria. Characteristics of science. Hypotheses, theories, and laws. These are three very important terms for us. A theory in science is a well-tested explanation for how something happens. Why does something occur? Hypothesis, this is a proposed explanation for why something happens, which has not been yet tested or it hasn't been adequately tested to be verified. A law in science is a description of phenomenon and conditions under which events are going to take place. Uh, typically, laws are mathematical models that we can use to uh, perform calculations. Now, if you reference back to the goals of science, theory accomplishes goal number one, explanatory power. Laws accomplish goal number two for predictive power. It's very important to note that theories do not become laws. Uh, if we said that that was the case, it would be analogous to saying that a kitten could grow up to become a dog. We know that that's not true. Uh, we also in science know that theories don't grow up and become laws uh, because they are in fact very, very, very different things and they accomplish the two different goals of science. In class, we will be investigating and looking at this in closer detail by doing a comparison of Newton's laws of gravity with Einstein's theory of general relativity which explained how gravity works. Science exists in a cultural context. We know that science is not always a direct ascent towards the truth. Uh, the first image here is the geocentric model or the Ptolemaic model, which was used for over 1,500 years. The problem was that it wasn't correct. Um, we now know, of course, that uh, the heliocentric model, which places the sun in the center of the solar system, is a more accurate depiction of uh, the Earth's position in the universe. Um, now, this model, uh, the heliocentric model, was proposed by Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler. It was not immediately accepted, um, so uh, especially by the Catholic Church. So we see that there's a uh, very important interplay between science and culture. Uh, the bottom image is looking at how classification systems have changed over time. Uh, if we look at the far left, the two kingdom system, this is what was in place when Linnaeus uh, proposed his uh, tax taxonomy system in the 1750s. Uh, all living things at that time were classified as either being plants or animals. Now, as discoveries were made over time, we learned that there were actually uh, you know, life forms that didn't really fit in the plants and they didn't really fit in the animals. So we moved to the three kingdom system, the five kingdom system. Uh, and then interestingly, in the 1970s with the work of Carl Woes, we actually moved uh, to a classification system called the three domain system where we have the eukaryota, which would include plants, animals, protists, and fungi. And then uh, Woes looked at the monera and actually broke them into two separate groups, the bacteria and the archaea bacteria. And even though they both have bacteria in their name, they are genetically as different from each other as either is from the eukaryota. Are experiments required in science? The answer to this question is no, they're not always required. We uh, can use field studies. Um, there are other ways that uh, scientists can work without needing to perform experiments, but of course experiments are an important part of science. Now within scientific studies, we are making observations. We're using the senses to gather information, which we call data in science. There's two types of data. We have qualitative data, which is descriptive. It deals with the qualities of things. Perhaps we might be looking at the color of something. We might uh, consider the odor of something. Quantitative data deals with numbers, qu uh, quantities. Uh, these are measurements. How much does something weigh? What is the length of an object? We use the observations, the data that we're collecting to form inferences, which is when we use, uh, we take that information and we form logical conclusions. Sampling, this is using a small subset of a population to represent a larger whole. We can't possibly gather information about every single carbon atom that exists in the universe, so we measure a small subset and we apply those results to tell us about carbon in general. Uh, also in science we use modeling. This, uh, this involves using representations of systems. Some are going to be computer driven, others are not. Now, 
back to scientific experiments. We know with scientific experiments uh, that in science we use something called a controlled experiment. I'll discuss an example here. Let's talk about testing a new experimental cancer drug. Of course we wouldn't test this right away in people. We'd want to test it in an animal model first. So we're going to test this cancer drug in mice that have been exposed to um, factors that are going to cause them to develop cancer. Okay. Now within those mice uh, we're going to have a control group. This is going to be mice who do not receive the new cancer drug. And then we're going to have a test group. This is mice that are going to be given the new drug. Uh, within the experiment we have many different variables. The independent, also called the manipulated variable, is going to be the cancer drug itself. The dependent or the responding variable, this is going to be uh, what happens to the mice after they've been given uh, the drug or not given the drug? Do the mice get cancer? Is the dependent the responding variable? It's also what we measure at the end of the experiment. Controlled variables are all the other conditions for the mice that are going to be the same. They're given the same food, they have the same water, they come from the uh, same genetic background or makeup, uh, they're exposed to the same types of factors which would cause them to develop cancers. After the end of the experiment, we're going to analyze the data. This is going to allow scientists to determine if the data are reliable and whether or not they support the hypothesis. Now, along this uh, line of thinking, we need to investigate the relationships of evidence and hypothesis. So our final slide is looking at this. I want you to imagine that um, it's Christmas time and there's a large box under the tree. Your name is uh, on that gift and uh, you've really been wanting a dog for Christmas. Now, hopefully somebody wouldn't wrap up a dog as a Christmas present, but you know, it's our example, okay? Now, a uh, statement here on the slide, uh, science does not prove things, but it's still very useful. I'm gonna try to explain to you why this is true, okay? So, we need to investigate four possible relationships of evidence and hypothesis. Uh, we're going to try this with our Christmas tree gift example. We have, uh, our evidence is that uh, we have a mammal, our hypothesis is that uh, we have a dog, okay? now. Uh, point A says if H so E. This means if the hypothesis is true, uh, the evidence must be there. Let's try it. If it is a dog in the box, it must be a mammal. Does this sound to be valid? Statement B, if the evidence is not there, the hypothesis must be wrong. Again, let's try this with mammal and dog. If it is not a mammal in the box, it must not be a dog in the box. Does this sound valid? Statement C, if not H, so not E. So if the hypothesis is wrong, the evidence must not be there. So if it is not a dog in the box, it must not be a mammal in the box. Does this sound to be correct? Finally, statement D, if E, so H. If the evidence is there, the hypothesis must be correct. If it is a mammal in the box, it must be a dog. Now, when we investigate these four different relationships, we want to know which ones work. And we know that A and B do, right? A is the one that would support a hypothesis. If the hypothesis is true, the evidence must be there. If it is a dog in the box, it must be a mammal. This is valid, right? Um, B also works, right? This is the relationship which would disprove a hypothesis. Um, if it is, n I'm sorry, if it is not a mammal, it must not be a dog. Okay? If the evidence isn't there, we have to reject the hypothesis. This is valid. Um, now, which one would prove a hypothesis? Uh, that one is D. Okay? But here's the problem. That relationship of evidence and hypothesis is not valid. If the evidence is there, the hypothesis must be right. Why doesn't this work? Well, let's use it with mammal and dog to understand why. If it is a mammal in that box, it must be a dog. Well, we know that that's not valid because inside of the box might be a cat. It might be some other mammal, right? So we know that that's not a valid relationship of evidence and hypothesis. Um, if the evidence is there, why doesn't it prove our hypothesis? Because there could be an alternate hypothesis which also pairs up with that evidence. So does this mean that science is not useful? Does this mean that science is uh, not worth our time? That's not the case at all. Um, we can't say in science that claims and theories, laws are proven. But we can say that they're useful because when we have claims in science that have been tested and the evidence matches up with the hypothesis and they've been tested again and again and again and the results always support the hypothesis, we become more and more and more confident in that hypothesis, more willing to say that we really believe that it's valid, that it's true, but 
people do science and people aren't perfect and we need wiggle room within science to go back and fix inaccuracies this is why we built into science the possibility to change ideas which are inaccurate well that's been our lesson for today thanks for joining me i'll see you next time